friendship. Rhodes? Where we're going, we don't need Rhodes. No. I am your father. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. You're listening to After the Ending, the only film podcast where we tell you what happens after the ending of your favorite films. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Spring and Phil Edwards. Hello, 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 and welcome to After the Ending. I'm Mike Spring. I'm Phil Edwards. And this is our first show of 2022. We're very excited. Right, we Phil? are indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's been a while, but it's been a nice break, but it's good to get back to it. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't that long, though. Not as long as our last break, our COVID break, which was like a year. Uh, this was just our normal December break. You know, we finished up in uh, mid-December, and here we are back in the you know semi-early part of January, and uh, we're back on track now. So uh, we have a, uh, you know, a very special episode tonight, you know, which in... TV parlance would mean that one of us is probably going to have some kind of tragedy or something like that. But that's not what we mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a very special episode of Blossom, you know, and, and then something <laughs> bad happens to somebody, you know. But that's not what we're doing tonight. Um, it's a very special episode because we are uh, eschewing our normal format because it is time for us to share our top 10 films of 2021. And we figured that deserves full attention, right? you know, top 10 films of 2021, full stop. We don't need to spend time with other segments or things like that because this is going to have some, we're going to have some discussion. We're hoping to get some comments from our live viewers. Uh, so we want to give this all the time and not feel rushed. Right, Phil? That's right, yeah. So it's it's always one of those things when we've done it in the past, it's we've always overrun the, the time we put aside for it. So yeah, we thought, let's just, let's just bask in the glory that was 2021 cinema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm glad this. you said that. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, 2021, like 2020, was a bit of a mishmash of a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not 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 my favorite year, but um, yeah. but but some interesting uh, some interesting movies at least. How how would you, Phil? How would you say 2021 was for film? Would you say it was like one of those? You know, there's some of those years you look back on. You know, like 1986 or 2017. I think some of those years where you're like, hey, that was that was a really great year for film. How, how would you say this one falls kind of in the grand scheme of things? Was it really good, mediocre, terrible? I I think somewhere between really good and mediocre. <laughs> Okay. I think, I think there were some films that were meant to be due out uh, in 2020 or early 2021, which didn't uh, arrive until later in the year. But there was there was some big films. I mean, there was the whole thing as well, the mix between cinema and streaming, and lots of films going day to uh, same day release on streaming and on cinema. I think lots of the HBO Max ones and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's it's been a bit of a upheaval kind of time for cinema but it's been a lot better than 2020 when we didn't know what was going on and there was lots right. of things just moved around there's still been some films which were due out last year which have been pushed back and some which were due out the start of this year which have been being pushed back because of various surges and waves and things mm -hmm. like that but it's yep. uh, on the whole i mean looking at the list of films i did watch there's been i'm just looking down at it now so when uh, i'm looking off there it's just there were some really really good films some surprising films also some lousy films but it's silver versus calm i think it's been a bit more on track compared to 2020 sure yeah. low bar admittedly i think yeah, to beat yeah. 2020 but um yeah yeah what about you? you know um there's, there's a lot of movies i enjoyed uh i i would say it was a solid enough year i think that uh, it's hard to deny COVID had an impact. I think that when I looked at my list, what I noticed was there's a lot. Of, it was easy for me to find 10 films that I loved right now when we've done the top 10 for every year from 19, what, 17 all the way through 2021 now. So we've done this enough times to know there are some years where it can be hard to find 10 good films. And there are some years where you can barely get it down below 20. I had yeah. no problem at all finding 10 films that I really enjoyed. Um, what I thought was interesting was when I came down to like trying to put them in order, I found that there was hardly any that really leaped ahead of the pack for me in terms of like, there was no one where I was like, well, that's clearly my number one film for the year. Or, you know, that's my top two. Like it was more like, Hey, these are the four or five films that I really love the most and, and four or five more that I really love. But there wasn't sort of anything where I was like, well, that's it. That's my number one. Easy. I'll just build the list from there. I kind of had to look at the list and go, huh? Which ones are the which one of these would I say is my favorite? You know, um, and so I, I 
you know, it's one of those things where I could do this list again in a month and maybe the order of it would be completely changed. You know, there wasn't yeah, that yeah. sort of definitive order that I, I can find a lot of times where it's just like, well, that's a no brainer. That's number one. That's number two. That's number three done, you know. Um, so, but yeah, overall it was, it was a fun year for movies. I thought, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, my list not to spoil anything is, is not laden with um, really deep, heavy movies. I definitely leaned in on the popcorn fair this year. Um, that's but I think that's, I can't yeah, I think so too. Real life was serious enough that I didn't need to go, you know, searching out like, you know, period dramas about people dying and, you know, oppression and things like that. Like, I just wanted to have fun watching movies, you know, so you, I think you'll see that reflected in my list quite a bit. Yeah, mine's a bit of a mix of both. I mean, just before we started, I said there was quite a, there was a few surprises on the list, which films which I'd heard about, which I thought I uh, wouldn't make my list, but then I watched them and really really liked what they were doing and you were saying about what the order they're in as well I, I was my list has been changing constantly I've been going back and forth on the letterbox uh, I've just moving them around but there's there was a couple of well two or three films near the top which kept sort of staying around there and my number one is actually a joint film or well, joint two films because they just kept going back and forth and in the end I went right they're both number one and they're both wildly different films but mm -hmm. I just thought because we just kept doing my head in swapping them over and I was just going no that's a joint one right, very right. Different, but it's yeah that's that's the way it is totally fair totally fair all right look we've got a comment already holy crap oh, hi Angie <laughs> um I have no idea what it means so maybe you can decipher it yeah uh, Angie's an old friend um from uh, Reading Festival and from uh, Brentford Okay. Hi, uh, and we met, and she, she called me Safari Phil when we first met because at a music festival, I was wearing a shirt, which was a bit like a Safari kind of jungle wear, as it were. Ah. But yeah, yes, yes. Hi, Angie. I hope you will. <laughs> awesome, great. Glad that's, to a have good, you. that's a good uh, segue into people watching this video live on yes. uh, Facebook. You can leave comments like Andy just did, and we can say. Uh, we can say hello. We can bring them up there. You can join the discussion, share your favorite films, tell us if we're, our films are absolutely rubbish picks for the best films of 2021 and so on. But yeah, that's yeah, this, uh, is a, this is a fun show for people to participate in because we're going to talk about a lot of current movies that you've just seen in the last few months. So we want to hear from you guys, you know, like to, to give us your thoughts as we as we lay them out for you. If you love the movie we talk about, if you hated a movie we talk about, throw them in the comments. We'll be happy to read them out on air and, 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 and converse and interact with you guys. It's, it's always a lot more fun. So um, yeah. Yeah, so we're looking forward to that. I also imagine it'll be uh, spoiler-free on the whole. There might be yeah. a few little things that slip, slip through, but we'll mention the film that we like, and then we'll discuss them. So if it's a film, you know, you can always mute us or whatever. But, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. think it'll be too heavy on spoilers. No, I don't. There's only one movie on my list that I think really has any kind of, uh, well, maybe like two that kind of have some minorly spoilery, spoilery stuff, but I'm not planning on spoiling them so yeah if you hear us you know like, like phil said if you want to mute us for you know a minute or two while we talk about a film you haven't seen totally fine but none neither of us is going to give away any major plot points you know yeah. so I, I think it's relatively safe in that regard yeah okay so uh shall we, we do uh, good stuff then yes yeah, should we do some honorable mentions first which didn't make the top yes 10? yes 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 let's do that we had said we we're going to do that we're going to share our honorable mentions um do you want to start you want me to start uh, well, yeah, I'll start. I'll do. I'll do like the five which almost made the list. Okay. There was nobody. Mm -hmm. Don't look up. Mm -hmm. Ghostbusters Afterlife. Mm -hmm. Bo Burnham's Inside, which I was on and on whether it's actually classed as a film, but it was really good anyway. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, Night House. Okay. All right. Cool. Good. Uh, my I have three um honorable mentions i have four but one i'm not going to mention yet because i have a strong suspicion it's on your list and i want to be able to discuss it then i don't want to get into the discussion of it now okay uh my three honorable mentions are uh the last duel uh, the ridley scott film which really surprised me was even in consideration uh the mitchells versus the machines the animated film which is a lot of fun that was a good film um, yep yeah. and the marksman with uh, liam neeson so those yes are three. That, that didn't make my list but that was a surprising film i was expecting it to be very cheesy and like that but mm -hmm. that was a real good film it really was it was it was definitely in consideration it didn't quite make the cut but um all three of those were films i, I really enjoyed so mm -hmm. good all right some that strong means, yeah. honorable mentions to start people off with i think yeah okay so phil um maybe let's see why don't i go first because i think if you've got a tie for number one we should save that for last right so if yeah, i start yeah. first then you'll go last so i think that works out the best yeah right? yeah 
That's I know good. usually it's like the other way around. You want to be like, no, I want you to go first. So I have the last one. But I think in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, I don't know. I can't think of the word now. I, you know, I'm going to pass it off to you because I want you to have the the final say with, with the double whammy. And we'll see what those two films are. Cause I'm intrigued. So, yes. okay. Then let's, let's see. All right. So my number 10 is cop shop. Uh, it stars Joe Car. Uh, it's directed by Joe Carnahan, who's you know been doing uh, really intense action movies for quite some time now. It stars uh, Shea Wiggum, uh, and no, Shea Wiggum or Frank Grillo. I always get them. Um, Frank Grillo. Frank, Frank Grillo. Sorry, uh, it's got Frank Grillo, Gerard Butler. Um, and in an astounding performance, Alexis Louder, who I think is largely unknown, but is just absolutely amazing in this movie. Um, Cop Shop surprised me for a couple of reasons. First of all, the commercials on TV for it were pretty awful. Didn't re- It made me want to watch it only in the way of like, I really love action movies. So it was like, yeah. well, that looks kind of up my alley. I didn't even realize it was Joe Carnahan when I saw the commercials for it. But the first five minutes or so of the film, I was kind of like, oh, man, this film's going to be obnoxious. It's got like day glow colored captions it's it 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 the first five or ten minutes really seems like it is trying way too hard to be cool and it kind of turned me off a little bit so i was like i gotta suffer through this movie and then that was apparently just i don't know why it was like that but then it kicked into gear and it was phenomenal uh basically it's this criminal he's on the run he's from people trying to kill him so he goes and gets himself arrested on purpose so he can get thrown in jail where he thinks he'll be safe uh one of the other criminals decide one of the assassins decides hey i'll copy that and ends up in jail with him uh and they're in this kind of small town police station and then things very quickly and very rapidly go to hell straight from there and before you know it it is like suspense and action and some comedy and some intense not comedy and all kinds of stuff mixed together um Frank Grillo is great. Gerard Butler is great. But Alexis Louder, you don't expect to see performances that really stick with you in just flat out action movies. But she is absolutely phenomenal. Completely stole the show. I was not familiar with her before this movie, um, but I I thought she was amazing in Cop Shop. And it's just a a fun, fun movie. I didn't expect it to make my top 10 list. But like ever since I watched it a month or two ago, it's sort of like keep thinking about it i keep going man that was an interesting interesting film i really enjoyed that film um so that's my number 10 cop shop definitely worth tracking down yeah it is very good and it's my number 10 as well hey look at that well yeah i it's, agree it's, with everything you said i was uh i saw the trailer and i was like going, oh, not sure right. but i ended up going to see when it was released there was uh, i had a bit of free time so i went to the cinema to see it oh cool uh, it was pretty empty at the time but uh I just loved it. I mean, I know what you mean about the opening. It's almost it was trying almost to be like a Tarantino kind of thing. Yeah, like, right. Seventies grainy thing, but not not managing it. Yeah, and yet Joe Carnahan, of course. I was, I didn't twig it was him at first until I, I saw his name pop up. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, everything you said, I totally agree. It's a bit like a soul song, piece in thirteen at some point, but with more humor, things like that. But uh, yep. Alexis Slaughter, she is just absolutely brilliant. Right, great things. I also, I I hope there's a director's cut because. Uh, I read with an interview with Frank Grillo, who said he was a bit disappointed because lots of his scenes, there's more going on with him, which mm. are being cut. And I, I think it might build a bit more on the backstory, even though you do find out what's going on. But I'd be right. intrigued to see a director's cut. But yeah, mm. good, solid, pretty much one location uh, action thriller. And when the, uh, I forgot the other guy's name, the guy with the balloons turns up. Oh, my God. Yeah, Toby Huss. Is yeah, he's, yeah, he's really good. He's, he is. It, it goes, you think it's going big and loud but then he shows up and all bets are off but yeah really yeah. good a nice surprise that one absolutely absolutely uh I'm, I'm glad that it made your list then phil this seems like an opportune moment to mention that we do not know each other's lists uh a long time listeners of the show will know that we always do that right we don't tell each other yeah, our yeah. picks ahead of time but for anybody who's joining us new uh phil and i create our lists completely independent of each other and we do not know each other's picks until right this very moment so that was just a fun coincidence yeah um, very good yeah so all right i like it well my number nine i know is not on your list okay because it was one of your honorable mentions um, oh, okay. so, yeah, cool. so i'm glad it made that at least my number nine is nobody uh starring bob odenkirk so um also a flat out action movie and if you think to yourself well it's bob odenkirk doing in an action movie you gotta watch nobody uh, did not make a splash at the box office. It's kind of one of those films that kind of sort of came and went. Um, but man, it is phenomenal. Um, it's a hard. It's it's so so basic. You know, quick story. It's a you know this this guy. He's kind of a milk toast, like you know, everyday husband, whatever. Uh, and then something 
happens that sort of has, causes him to sort of his past self to come out. And his past self apparently was a bit of a badass. And he goes on this sort of mission of like revenge slash justice. And it just turns into like an all out assault on everything. And I was really surprised. I wasn't that surprised that Bob Odenkirk could pull it off. Right. Because oh, yeah. he's and a he's good actor doctor. and anybody can do physical training. And I, you know, so I wasn't that surprised about it. I just, didn't expect to enjoy the movie as much as I did. Um, it's very violent, and and that's okay. Uh, you know, just to tell people that going into it, it's a very violent movie. Um, but it, it's just I don't know. It kind of felt a little throwbacky in a way, like just to the sort of like you know my favorite kind of genre of films is like 90s action movies you know i just yeah, i yeah. love like 90s action movies because they're like sort of simple and straightforward and to the point they had a sense of fun and they were you know over the top and you know explosiony and all that stuff and and um nobody sort of had that feel to it like it wasn't overly concerned with giving you too much story you know it didn't take itself too seriously but man it was just like balls to the wall action and i i really enjoyed it and it surprised me quite a bit so um that's what i'm looking forward to re-watching so number nine is nobody definitely yeah, uh, good, worth a look if you haven't seen it yeah it's a good good pick as i said it was an honorable mention it's obviously got john wick parallels but i think it's a lot it's a lot cleaner and tighter with this yeah and it does you know and Right. And one of the things now, one of the things I like about John Wick is sort of that whole story about like the hotel and the assassins yeah, yeah. and the coins and all that. And that's one of the things that makes those movies great. But this one doesn't bother with that. And that's kind of nice also. Yeah. Right. Like this yeah. movie isn't trying to be more than what it is. Um, it just really focuses on making the action scenes as visceral and dynamic as they can be without being like overly, overly bloody or gory or yeah. things like yeah. that. You know, they're just intense um, and stylish. So, yeah. Yeah, good call. Good call, Phil. Definitely. Some nice, nice, nice editing as well. I love the little editing with the, uh, with the the montage of them just at the start. You know, going through the same day over and over. I love yes. that kind of thing. That that was yes. done so well. Absolutely. Really covers covers how his mundane as life is in just a short space of time. Exactly. Good pick. Good pick. Okay. Well, my number nine is uh, is one. It's a bit art house. It was delayed from twenty twenty. I think it went back and good. forth, but it's uh, the Green Knight. Uh, the David Lowry directed film starring, uh, I've got all the names, Dave, Dev Patel. Uh, and it's basically a riff. Well, it's it's the Seguin and the Green Knight poem made into a film. It's a heavy old style poem made into a heavy old style film. But it's uh, David Lowry. He's very, he loves his dreamlike, slow paced kind of things. Uh, this one, compared to some of his other films, had a bit more, a bit more. Um, to it, I suppose, is the way to do it because it was there was lots of few different characters. He goes, it's like a quest, fantasy quest thing, but very sedate, very slow, very dreamlike. Uh, but it's there's a bit of humor in it as well, some nice touches. I love I love the actual Green Knight itself when they, they arrive. But I've always liked the uh, Seguin and the Green Knight story. It even mentions the wilds of Wirral, where I live, but it's not, mm, not cool. as wild as it once was. But uh, yeah, I just really liked it. There was some beautiful scenery. Uh, like the giant when he sees the giants there's a little fox but let down a little bit by some of the cg looking too much cg but uh, on the whole really good typical a24 film when you think about it but uh dev patel was really good i like the fact there's it, there was no mention of arthur king arthur and things like that but it was just it was one of those ones where it's just a journey i just watched it it was one when was it it was on a sunday i think it was a a, a misty day as well so when it came out it was all like being part of it, I know Mike's probably going, Ugh, but uh, I really it dug it. It was uh, it was worth the wait. I felt. I mean, I, I haven't only saw it the once. I'd like to do a rewatch of it just to see whether it still still hits. But uh, that was my number nine, The Green Knight. Okay, so I don't want to get too inside baseball on people here, but for the film geeks among us, I think they'll understand what I mean when I say that, you know, you mentioned that it's a, a typical a 24 film while I was watching the film, I started composing in my head, the like a 24 guide to making films because like it just touched <laughs> on every a 24 thing ever. And I was just like, okay, the green Knight, like soundtrack composed of one string on one instrument, Check. <laughs> you know, shot of a car, or in this case, a horse from overhead. And then it turns upside down. Check, you know, story that only barely makes sense. Check, like all of these things that A24 films do over and over and over again that I absolutely abhor were in The Green Knight. Um, it, it was not my, it's not on my list. I can tell you that. I, I didn't think it was as terrible as some movies like Midsummer, 
and you know uh hereditary and things like that and maybe because it wasn't really a horror horror movie i do agree i did love the visual of the green knight i'll give you that yeah one. yeah um by and large man that was like two hours of my life i will never get back and it was so boring and just so a24 it was like good lord could you make a more a24 film than the green knight i don't think you could like it's like the poster child for everything a24 does um yeah. So I can't yeah. argue with any of that. I know exactly what you mean, but I, I really, <laughs> right. I know what you mean. And, it's, 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 and that's the thing. If you like the A24 aesthetic, you'll probably love the Green Knight. I know other yeah. people besides yourself who are really into their movies and they, they love the Green Knight. I, I don't like their movies at all, generally speaking, and I didn't like the Green Knight. So it really depends on what your vibe and aesthetic for movies is, I think, you know. So, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, not but one. yeah as, as I said, it's a slow moving very uh, film so it kind of it depends a lot on your mood when you do sit down to watch it but I, I felt it was worth worth taking a couple of hours or however long it was sure yeah, yeah. it felt like about seven yeah so, you know set aside the better part of an afternoon yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right all right very good okay um so my number eight then uh, is, yeah, could have been higher, you know, but I, I think this is about the right place for it for me, actually. It is Dune, uh, a much talked about movie directed by Denis Villeneuve. Great cast. I won't name them all. I think I'm pretty sure everybody saw the commercials for Dune or has seen Dune. I know yeah. it's a little bit of a polarizing film. I know there are some people who uh, were like, WTF, what did I just watch? Like, I hated it. That was too slow or too bland looking or this or that. I did not go into it with high expectations. Um, I'm weirdly fascinated with the whole Dune universe. And if you go back a few episodes, we did a kind of a Dune journey episode right. where we talked about it. Um, but I have yet to ever really come across that Dune thing that I that I really, really loved is what I had said at the time. And I said I was hopeful for the new movie. Um, and then I went and saw the new movie. And I went to see it in the cinema. I went to see it on the big screen. It's the first one on my list that I saw it at, in theaters um, because I wanted to experience the visuals of it and the world, you know, on the big screen. And I really enjoyed it, I have to say. it's It stops just shy of being one of those movies that I'm going to say, like, oh, I loved it. You know, like that kind of movie where it's like I want the T-shirt yeah, and, like, yeah. you know, the lunchbox, you know, the – all of that stuff, which would probably just be like a beige lunchbox, you know, it's a, oh, no, a lunchbox like the one he puts his hand in. That, that yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, it stops a little short of that, but for a movie that I had very limited expectations for, because I do find, while I think Dune can be interesting, I find more often than not, it comes across badly. Um, I really liked the, I thought the story was well told. It was easy enough to follow. I thought, I thought, um, I found it visually very appealing. I like the look of it. I know people complain it's all brown and it's it's yeah, too yeah. bland or whatever, but I I didn't I get it. I agree in that I can't say it's not all brown, but it didn't bother me the way it does some other people. I thought it worked for the world of Arrakis. You know, um, I like the actors in it. I thought the cast was really good. I thought the the action scenes were good. Um, you know, I just I I dug it. I thought it was neat. And and I mentioned this. Um, I think I mentioned this. I don't know if I mentioned, I think I mentioned an episode, but maybe I didn't um, sort of a weird compliment I have for it was, I think I know I mentioned this at some point, but I'm saying it again is that um, there was a good amount of male affection in the movie, which included men touching each other in affectionate ways. And that sounds weird, but what I mean is like, there was like a scene of like a dad, like touching his son's face and like yeah, yeah. male characters who are happy to see each other, like hugging each other. And it's something that you miss in a lot of mainstream Hollywood. And I think it's because, you know, there's toxic masculinity that's out there. They're everyone's so afraid that God forbid two men should touch that, you know, all the people in, you know, the red States wearing Trump hats are going to get all up in arms because it's gay or whatever. And it's, you know, it's stupid. And so I was like, yes, that's, I like to see that affection. It, it makes you, get much more invested in the characters. And you're like, this is a dad who loves his son. That's yeah. what's missing in some of these movies. And these two characters who we're supposed to understand very quickly have this really, you know, deep friendship, this connection beyond friendship. And then when they, when they reunite, they, they hug each other, which is what people would do in real life, you know? Yeah. And, so I, and that was a really, I thought, um, it helps really build the relationships, doesn't important. it? It really did. It really did for me, actually. And I thought that it was a nice touch that you don't see a lot of in those big blockbuster types of movies. So it was one of those things that, like I said, it's kind of an odd thing to notice. But I really do give the film a lot of credit for that. So, um, yeah, I liked Dune a lot. I thought it's 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 big. It's 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 epic. It was neat. I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to watching it again when it comes out on video in a couple of weeks. Um, and I really want to dive into it again. So that's my number eight is Dune. Excellent. Well, uh, I might be talking about that in a bit. I, I had a feeling. I had a feeling it'd probably end up on your list. I, I wonder. I wonder what you'll think of uh, whether you'll reassess this when the second one comes out. You know, because it's it's basically 
one story in right. two parts. Split it? in half. Yeah. 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 I think I think that's good though. I think it gave it room to breathe, you know. So I'm hoping yeah. that I'll 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 enjoy the second half just as much. Okay. Well, my number eight is uh, another film that you won't like. Uh, it's Wes Anderson's uh, The French Dispatch. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Which is uh, one of the most Wes Anderson films I've ever seen. It's almost like a parody of a Wes Anderson film. <laughs> Uh, it really is. But uh, I really, I do like Wes Anderson films. And this one, I quite like it. It was a little bit different from his films because it's basically like an anthology of stories, all with the framework of the French Dispatch newspaper, whose editor, played by Bill Murray, had died. And then it cuts to different stories, most of them in black and white, but then going from animated oh, segments yeah. and bits and pieces. But it's, I love, I, 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 one of the main things I like is the, is the detail, the way all the sets uh, everything's in its place. It just has this as the Wes Anderson aesthetic, which we all know and either love, hate, or go, hmm. But, uh, yeah. and also the use of miniatures. There was lots of uh, miniatures in the foreground and background and the cutaways and things like that. As I said, it was, it was the most Wes Anderson film. It's got elements out of all his other films all thrown into this one. So if you've never seen any Wes Anderson, but you want a crash course, just watch The French Dispatch. But it's, uh, yeah. as usual, it has a huge cast. His own, I'm not going to, Listen, but it's it's the usual crew and a few others. Um, I think my favourite bit, and I would like to see more though, was the uh, was the cycling reporter with uh, Owen Wilson, which was just funny and had some great little lines. But the most, I think, the most impressive one was the private dining room of the police commissioner, which featured Jeffrey Wright talking about this merely had, and it just ends up to this big bizarre car chase and things like this all over the place involving poison fights and a strong man on the window of a car but that's uh that's my number eight okay. i don't think i don't think it's going to be on mike's list <laughs> you'd be correct sir um yeah no uh i i don't wanna, i don't want to tear into it too much it's first of all though it's not a film it's a magazine uh presented in film format um second of all yeah, you say, funny, yeah, yeah. yeah, you say it's mostly black and white, but he, here's the thing. It's annoyingly not. It's half black and white and half color, but not mm -hmm. one half is black and white, one half is color. It's literally like one scene is in color and one scene is in black and white. And I get that he's trying to sort of ma uh, mimic what magazines look like where they have like color pictures and black and white photos, but I didn't even agree with some of the choices of where he chose to put black and white and where he chose to put color. Like the first time he reveals a painting that's in color, he shows it in black and white. And you're like, I'm not even sure what I'm looking at. It's very abstract to begin with. So it's like a little color would go a long way to helping me decipher what the hell I'm supposed to be seeing on screen. <laughs> I can't even get that right. Second of all, every single frame of the film is a square. Every single frame, every single frame of the film is a square. It is the most obnoxious and annoying thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I just, oh my God. It's but what do you really think of Wes Anderson films? Like? Infuriating. I just, it just made me so insane. Um, yeah, I, it, not a fan, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, it was good. Uh, and it's my number eight. Okay, very yeah. good. All right, enough said. Okay. Uh, Nine number seven is uh, kind of a horror movie. I, it's not really a horror movie. It's I, I call it more. It's more of a thriller. I think that's more accurate. Okay. My number seven is Escape Room Tournament of Champions. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. And here's the thing. So quietly, director Adam Robitel has created a really fascinating little horror movie universe in the corner that people are not paying attention to uh and it kind of bums me out i wish the second movie had done better than it did because they've really set up this neat sort of world and this neat sort of mythology that i could easily see them doing for several movies right way easier than something like final destination or some yeah. of these other ones you know um because the premise which is basically, you know, people get into these, you know, get put in these escape rooms. They're run by this sort of mysterious organization and the escape rooms are trying to kill them. And, and then, then when one person gets out, they're the winner. Right. Um, and so the Tournament of Champions follows up the first film by bringing back the first couple the, the main characters from the first one who survived and then introducing this idea of like, hey, these are all winners from previous escape rooms. Now they're getting shoved together into one situation. And you would think like, why would they go to an escape room? But they don't. It's more clever than that. And like yeah. you sort of watch these films trying to um, find the flaws in them. And they're very few because they're really well crafted. 
Um, they're not gory. They're not bloody, which I like. They're, they're super intense and they're, they're, you know, scary in that way of being like, what's going to happen? Who's going to live? Who's going to die? How they can get out of this room with almost no blood. And I'm not opposed to the horror movies having blood, but sometimes it just becomes a crutch. Like be more creative than that. And these movies do that. Um, they, they create characters that are interesting. Uh, the second one really had some neat twists and turns that sort of bring in some elements that you're not expecting, which I really enjoyed. Um, and, and like I said, sort of quietly, I've seen both of the, the escape room movies twice now. Um, and I, just, I really love them. I, I just think they're so well crafted and they're really um, rewarding. And when you watch them back to back, you can see some, some connectivity and some clues and things like that. And they really set you up for a great third one, which I hope we'll see. Um, so that was my number seven escape room tournament champions. Really, really fun. Um, and just a good thriller uh, keeps you on the edge of your seat all the way up till the end. So, and, yeah. and, and sorry, and stars Taylor Russell from lost in space, which is of course like my favorite TV show in the world. So um the new Lost in Space, not the original. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. You've mentioned them a few times. You have not seen them, but it's uh, it's a good, as you said, it's a good way you can you can have different scenarios. And because it's an escape room, you can just have somebody has a great idea for like, oh, we could have this kind of scene, da, yep. da, da, and you can put it in, and it fits better than just trying to shoehorn it into whatever franchise, right? Like Saw franchise or whatever things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, like yeah, I like the fact it's building up a shared universe kind of thing as well. Yeah, they're really neat. I, I think when you watch them, you'll really enjoy them. And also good for like, they're PG-13. So like either younger, like teenagers. And my daughter is a really big fan of them. She's 14. Um, but or if you have somebody who's kind of like mildly likes horror, but doesn't like the gory, the bloody stuff, but still you want to watch a good kind of thriller horror movie with them. These are the way to go because they're they're intense and they're, you know, they're super make you nervous, but like it's not. A ton of blood and guts you know which i know turns off some people so um, yeah, i think yeah, they got yeah. a pretty wide audience range which i like about them okay cool okay my my number seven is a film i didn't think it'd be on the list because when i was heard about it i was interested uh in it but i just didn't really float my boat but then i sat and watched it and was blown away by it but it's spencer directed by pablo lorraine and starring uh kristen stewart as princess diana and it's all about this one time when she goes to uh, spend Christmas with the royals after the Prince Charles affair has broken with the news. And it's following her. You follow her for most of it. It's just dealing with that, dealing with the things going on in her head. There's some, the way it's shot is, is, is fantastic. It's almost like a, a thriller with elements of psychological horror at some points, just the way it's, it's filmed, like the, the grounds of the palace, the old house that she lived in. Uh, the things going on, her imagination, what she wishes she could do at the dinner table. Uh, but it's all about this, well, Princess Diana, but it's it just shows how all of the royals feel trapped with tradition and things like this and uh, how Diana just wants to spend time with the kids and she just wants to just, she just wants to get away and she can't believe that it's a, all these things are just focused on her when it should be on Charles and it's just, Christian Stewart's performance was just incredible. Everything about it was just so well done. Again, the set dressing, the costumes, the cast. Uh, Timothy Spall's character is just, mm. just menacing. And, and again, it adds to this whole kind of drama. I love Sally Hawkins' character and Sean Harris as the chef. Like, uh, you just... You could just see how much you can see how much he he, he cares for for Diana and just wants it to he's made a special meal for her and things like this. But it just blew me away. Everything about it was so well done. The great the, the music choices as well. And Christian Stewart's performance was uh, was sublime. But that's my number seven. Excellent. I I have not seen that one, so it didn't make my list. Uh, but it sounds intriguing. So, uh, but I did think at first you meant the Spencer Confidential movie that Netflix put out with Mark Wahlberg. Oh my God, no, no, and, much. Um, I haven't seen that one either yet. But I was surprised. I was like, huh, I didn't think that would, that didn't seem like the kind of thing that would be high on your list. But then obviously it's something else. So. Yes, yes, no, not uh, that one. No. All right, cool, good pick. All right, interesting. Okay, so our both our number sevens were ones the other one hadn't seen. So another yes, little yeah. sort of parallel there. Yeah. Um, all right. My number six, uh, I, I will say surprise. I've had a few surprises on my list. This one is one of them. It is, it was uh, wrath of man uh, directed by Guy Ritchie and starring Jason Statham. Now, not a surprise because Jason Statham, we all know what a big fan of the state I am. Uh, he's one of my favorites and I watch every movie he does, um, but I'm not a big Guy Ritchie fan by and large. And, and, you know, his sort of gangstery crime stuff isn't always up my alley. So I, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, 
I honestly didn't know he directed it at first until I watched the credits or until it started rolling because I just yeah, saw it was yeah. Jason Statham. Didn't really do well in theaters, but basically it's it's a uh, uh, Statham plays a a um, armored truck driver. He has sort of a secret. He is there in this art organization uh, for a reason. We don't know what it is, but we know he's a badass and there's some bad things going on around him. And that's all I'm going to say about the story because it has a surprising amount of kind of twists and turns in it. But uh, again, leaning heavy on the action as an action film, it is just at, like top notch. I mean, really intense action sequences. Honestly, reminded me at times of like Heat. That big shootout in Heat has that kind of vibe oh, yeah. to it. You know, very Michael yeah. Mann, very visceral, very intense, but serious. It's a serious film for sure. Um, Josh Hartnett gives an amazing performance, which is not words I say very often, uh, but he's <laughs> absolutely terrific in it. It's got a really good supporting cast, a lot of recognizable faces, you know, well known. Some that you're kind of like, I don't know who this guy is. He looks kind of familiar, but I really, I literally like him. Um, you know, just uh, a really well crafted, intense action thriller uh, that was just way better than I expected it to be. Um, if if you even I will say my wife kind of came into the room in like the last I don't know twenty minutes of it and was like, oh, this is you know what's this? I was like, Wrath of Man. She's like, okay, I'm just kind of sitting and playing on her phone, and then like within like two minutes got sucked into watching and sort of watched like the last 20 minutes of the movie. She was like, that was really good from what I saw. But I'm like, right, that's what I mean. You know, it's, it's sort of even somebody who wasn't watching any of the earlier stuff still kind of got sucked into it. So it's, it's yeah. wrath of man uh, with Jason Statham. And that's my number six. Yeah. I saw that. It came on uh, Amazon prime and it's uh, oh, good. last time we talked yeah, about it. I don't think you've seen it yet. Yeah. It's uh, it's really, it's really good. Uh, I agree with everything you say. It's probably be an honorable mention for me now thinking about it, but it's, sure. it's a, uh, and it was also it's a remake of a of a European film, maybe a French one. So maybe that's why French, the, right now that you mentioned yeah, it, it maybe that's of, why it didn't have the Guy Ritchie kind of feel to it. Yeah, it might maybe be, might be. Yeah. right. But yeah, I like the way the reveals and things as it goes mm -hmm. on. Good film. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good pick. Okay, well, my number six. That yeah, is six, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. my number six is uh, Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog, a Western drama. It's, yep. uh, I do like Jane Campion. I do like the piano. Uh, this one stars Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Cody Smith McPhee, Kirsten Dunst, Jesse Plemons, and it's it's a western, but it's also a character study, and then it's a, a psychological drama, a thriller, and then it's also goes very dark, and it ends in a way I wasn't expecting. I, mm. I really like it because uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is playing this tough cowboy guy kind of guy. Where him and his brother own this ranch, and he's like, he's like trying to be the ultimate cowboy. Never washes. It's all about you know the rituals and things like that, and being taught how to be a cowboy. And he's the one with all the power. And then you realize as you get near the end, he's not the one with the power. And it's all this and stuff. And it looks absolutely gorgeous. It was filmed in part of New Zealand, but it's just big hills, big wide open spaces. Just the cinematography is just absolutely stunning. Inside the house, it's all shadows with just shafts of sunlight coming through, motes of dust. It's got a, a nice little uh, score to it going through, which just lifts and picks out scenes. And just, yeah, it's it surprised me. It was, it's sort of, I could see it going one way and then it didn't. And then it surprised me. And then at uh, the ending, I was just going, oh, that got really dark quick. Uh, and I, I probably might even... It might be even better on a on a rewatch as well, but that's uh yeah, that's my number six, the power of the dog. Interesting, interesting. I okay, now I have on Netflix. Seen, what's that? Oh, Netflix, right? Yep, yeah. yeah. I haven't seen that one yet. Um, it's interesting. I I when I first saw it came out, I put it on my queue because I'm like, oh, Benedict Cumberbatch, good cast, you know, like looks interesting. And um, you know, I heard a few things about it, you know, that's very artsy and things like that and stuff, and, yeah. and um, which isn't isn't a problem for me, but like it's one of those ones where every time I go to pick a movie. I look at that one and go, ah, I'm not in the mood for that tonight. You know, like I, I, I don't know why it just feel, I feels like a movie I'm going to have to, um, I must work. admit I was like that initially. Okay. Yeah. I kept looking right. at it going, like going, well, I need to, I want to get these films watched, you know, make sure I've seen as many as I can. There's still yeah. many films I didn't get to see, but I was thinking, well, that's on Netflix. I can watch it. And then I go, Oh, <laughs> well, no, I've got them on the mood for it, but I know it's going to be slow. Okay. Uh, I'll watch a couple of episodes of this, but then eventually I did. I uh, just, yeah, I just pulled okay. me in and everything. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, then I will I will bump it up on my queue then on my list. I will put it higher up so I can watch it and see uh, if I agree or not. So, cool. all right. Very cool. 
Okay, my number five uh, will not come as a surprise to anybody who's been a long time listener to the show. Maybe they'll be surprised it's as low as it is if you want to consider it that way, if that's that's the surprise you're looking at. Um, but it is No Time to Die. That's my number five as well. Nice. All right. I got another. We got two at the same spot then. All right. So No Time to Die, 007, James Bond, uh, Daniel Craig and his swan song as, you know, James Bond, uh, directed by Kerry Fukunaga. Um I hope I said that right. I think so. Who knows? Um, I feel like I emphasized <laughs> it a little much, but uh, Kerry Fukunaga directing um, Daniel Craig, you know, uh, it, it, I thought it was really, really good. I liked it a lot. I thought the first half especially was stupendous. The action scenes in it were just amazing. I thought they really lived up to the bond like ethos of like these act like big explosive action scenes, the chase through Italy and stuff like that, you know, really phenomenal. Um, there's a couple moments in the second half where I thought it got a little confusing, not confusing, confusing, but just sort of like you had to sit there and go, wait a sec, what now? Okay. Okay. I think I got it. I got you. I got you. All right. I think I track what's happening here. There was a little talky stuff. Yeah. It yeah. was a little bit like, wait, what? Uh, okay. Yeah. Just take a second to sort of catch up to it, you know? Um, but I like the way the film ended. I thought it was a neat uh, way to do things a little bit different from how we've seen before. Um, I thought Craig was, was you know, great as always. I, I think his five film stretches bond is, is one of the, the, you know, greatest action movie franchise series around. Um, I think you and I may differ on that a little bit, Phil, um, but I really liked it. Uh, your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I thought Casino Royale was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. But then all the other ones I've thought have been, Oh, just yeah, and you're you're, place. you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, got, they just, they Quantum, just of Solace. Quantum of Solace, I'll give you, but Skyfall, I keep telling you, you got to rewatch it. I think it's brilliant. And yeah, I, actually, I don't really, I really, I really, I really like Skyfall. But anyway, really like yeah, but, yeah, but it just yeah, I, you know, I didn't like the other three. I did like Casino Royale, but this one again because of the other three, I was going. Mm, I wasn't expecting much. I wasn't expecting it to be on my top ten list, but uh, went and watched it and thought it was excellent. It was like it was. Like Casino Royale set it up, and then this there was a dip with the others, but then this one just carried it on and, and just had big action scenes. It was Bond going all over the place, being suave, being brutal, being all kinds of things, but also good story. Uh, Rami Malik, I thought was good. People were saying he was a he was a lousy bad guy, but his plan was just one of the best. Uh, yeah, and it just wrapped it up really well. It was good to have uh, one of the, the Bond actors actually have a contained, you know, a proper exit. He wasn't just like, uh, oh, suddenly they're not going to make another one with him. It was it was planned for this to be Daniel Craig's last film, so they could do it do, do it properly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's my number. Well, that's our number five. Yeah, good choice. All right, good. All mm -hmm. right, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed it. I know that you're, uh, you know, wrong on the other films, but um, <laughs> I uh, I'm glad that you're right on this one. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh my number four is uh a really fun action movie I, not an action i don't know what it is it's it's all kinds of genres it is free guy starring ryan reynolds and jody comer yeah. and uh directed by sean levy um i just really enjoyed the hell out of this one it was so much fun it it had the potential i think to be really annoying you know it's 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 this, this sort of intakes place inside a video game world you know ryan reynolds is plays a, like a non-player character who realizes he lives in the video game world and tries to sort of break out of that mold it's very heavily influenced by things like Fortnite and stuff like that um one of the things i really loved about it i watched it with my whole family we all really enjoyed it was you know whether you were super into video games like my kids you know in the middle like me or not into them at all like my wife the jokes are broad enough that you'll get them anyway they're funny enough that you'll get them even if you don't catch all of the individual references but if you're yeah. immersed in the gamer world you'll definitely also be able to say oh that's clearly a Fortnite thing or that's a half-life thing or things like that but at no point if you miss any of that thing is it going to take away from your enjoyment of the film um i thought it was really funny i thought the visuals were great i thought it had the potential to be annoying it could have been way too over the top or ryan reynolds could be a little bit too snarky whatever you know uh, he's actually a very earnest character um but it all really gelled together nicely um the story was good the the humor was great the 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 references and things were a lot of fun the cameo appearance is maybe the best cameo appearance of all time i think yeah. hopefully you know what i'm talking about um yeah. you know a lot of great kind of references to real world things or, or other fictional media things it didn't have to do the thing where it's sort of like 
pretends to be something because it can't use the copyright. Like they went out and got the copyright so they could actually yeah, be yeah. like, here's this thing that everyone knows and loves. Um, and I thought Reynolds was great. And it's just a fun, fun, fun movie. Like, honestly, if you just want to sit there for two hours and just have a fun time and enjoy yourself, I don't think you can do any worse than Free Guy. Yeah, so actually, that's, I, I agree. It was at one point it was on my top ten list, but as other, I just got to see other films, it kept slipping down, moving down. Sure. But yeah, it's, it's, it was a lot of fun, and I agree yep. with everything you said. Yeah, a good pick, good pick. Okay, well, my number four is a film I didn't think would be on the list at all, especially when we've talked about this director's work in the past. Okay, uh, so it's it's Ridley Scott's The Last Duel. Ah, uh, yeah, which, uh, which I think you mentioned was that an honorable mention for you? It definitely yeah. was an honorable mention, which yeah. surprised the heck out of me. Yeah, because it's made uh, my list. It, it almost made my list. Yeah, well, I, I thought when it was in the top ten, I was going wow, but then when it's this high up as well, I was I was surprised. But it's it's a big historical drama as well, which I do like. Uh, but as as regular viewers, listeners will know, Ridley Scott's work is a bit all over the place sometimes. I mean, lots of people love lots of his stuff, but there's some of his more recent stuff. I just go, oh no. But this one was just fantastic. It's more well, like I love the whole Russia man. Uh, Russian one set up of it all with the different viewpoints. Uh, it deals with some heavy, heavy things, uh, all about you know how women, the way women have been treated back then and and still are and, and things like that. But the the performances by everybody were just superb. Uh, Jody, was it Jody Comer, yeah, same um, same actress as in Free Guy, two yeah, very different. Guy, yeah, the difference Free Guy and then last year, oh my god. Yeah. I know. Uh, but Matt, Matt Damon, Adam Driver, and uh, Ben Affleck as well. Ben Affleck was amazing in this film. Yes, yes, he it's was. It's great to see he's got some uh, some good performances, and there's a, a new one just come on Amazon Prime, the Tender Bar one to watch as well. But anyway, but yeah, The Last Duel, it's just, I loved I loved it, and I loved the way when we did have the different viewpoints from the different people, you could see how the characters uh, differed from the way they saw themselves to the way other people perceived them. It was just so well acted. Uh, there's obviously some... He took some liberties with the, you know, the the visor during the last duel because a lot of people were complaining. Well, you don't wear armor like that, but you know, it's just so you could see the people at the end. I totally understand why they did it, but it's uh, it was so well done. It just you really felt like you were in the time period when it set. Uh, and you could just see you could see these things building up. You could see how terrible these people were, how terrible people were treated. You could see how brutal it was if you got involved in a fight in these things or if you got ill. Uh, yeah, just it just blew me away with how good it, it was and how much I enjoyed it. And it didn't do very well at the box office, but I think it's on Disney+. Plus. That's because that's where I saw it. Yeah, Disney+. Wow. Plus. Interesting. So if you haven't seen it, uh, watch it. It's really, really good. Heavy going in places, but it's, it's a really well-made film, really good film. And it's my number four. Yeah, good pick. Like I said, it was, it was definitely an honorable mention for me. Almost made my list, which is funny because if you say to me at the beginning of the year, hey, there's going to be a Ridley Scott historical drama that you're really yeah. going to like, I would have been like, you're stupid. Because uh, I yeah. generally am not a big Ridley Scott fan. I don't love historical dramas generally. It's not my genre of choice, you know. Um, but it, it really is, like you said, really well done. The, the Rashomon aspect of it, you know, telling the same story from different perspectives really surprised me because they didn't mention that in the marketing at all. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, so when I started watching it, I was like, well, that's interesting. I didn't really see that coming, but the performances are amazing. You know, like you said, it has heavy moments in place. But what I liked about it was so many films that deal with this sort of subject matter are so just dark and oppressive and they make you feel awful when you watch them and you just you're like i can't even look at the you know this movie managed to not do that without underplaying the seriousness of what was happening yeah, yeah. you know it's point. a serious yeah. film it has some humor in it um but you know it readily scott doesn't make a lot of you know comedies really but it it definitely um you can watch it and not feel like you're a bad person because you're watching these bad things happen to certain people you know um which i appreciated that it was able to find that that right balance in tone um which can be really hard to pull off you know um and there's some great action sequences in it and stuff and yeah i i, I liked it quite a bit that's a good pick thank you thank you yep. good. all right okay, well. Where we well, are, we're into the top three now. Top aren't we? three now. That's going to bring us to my number three, and I, I feel like I'm maybe going to repeat myself a little bit from what I said about Free Guy, because uh, my number three is also Free Guy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> my number three is Jungle Cruise, starring Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt. Um, I was super impressed by Jungle Cruise, and I, I, I'm not surprised because there are some movies when you watch the trailer for them. You know, and, and everyone's had an experience where you watch a trailer and you get pumped up and then you're super disappointed. But then there's other movies where you're like, I know this movie's going to be good. I can tell from the trailer that I'm going to love this movie. And 
and, and you're dead on. And, and Jungle Cruise was one of those movies. I loved the trailer. I thought it looked like so much fun. I went and saw the movie in theater and I had a blast, I had a actual, an absolute blast watching in theaters. It is a little bit Pirates of the Caribbean, a little bit The Mummy, a little bit uh, Indiana Jones, a little bit of everything. Yet I, and I know some people complain that it's just a ripoff of all these other films. I didn't feel that way. I felt like it was inspired by these other films and maybe homage some of them, but I felt like it, it, worked hard to create its own identity without you know and it, you know yeah wearing its influences on its sleeve but created a um a mythology in a world of its own that felt original and fresh enough to me you know um yeah. I, I thought you know dwayne johnson's got the charisma turned up to 11 uh emily blunt is terrific uh the film worked in a little bit of social commentary even without being heavy-handed or without you know um you know, overplaying it, but just at the same time, like saying, Hey, this is a big popcorn film, but we'll throw a couple important messages in there just in case. Um, I thought the special effects were really good. The action sequences were great. And again, I just sat there for two hours, the giant grin on my face, just a big smile from ear to ear watching this movie, having fun. It was, you know, people complain about making movies based on rides. It felt like I was on a ride for the entire running time of that movie. And that's a compliment in my opinion. You know, it was just super fun and exciting and enjoyable. My whole family loved it. Um, and I knew it was gonna be my top five the minute I saw it. And uh, this is where it lands at number three. So Jungle Cruise is my number three. Check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I've still not seen it, but I know it's on Disney Plus, so I'll have to check it out. It sounds like a good one to watch on a weekend, a Saturday afternoon kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Excellent. Okay. Totally. Well, my number three is uh, is one. It's a Danish film, a Danish action thriller comedy mm. drama. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, Riders, oh, Riders of Justice. What's it called? Riders of Justice. Riders of Justice. Riders of Justice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think, and it's all about. There's a, it opens up. There's a there's an accident on a train, and people get killed. And Mads Mikkelsen's uh, character, he's a soldier. He finds out that his wife was killed in this, and he he comes back from. He's on in the Middle East. He comes back to look after his daughter, but then this guy who was also on the train, who's he he has a theory that it wasn't an accident. So him and some friends approach Mads Mikkelsen, tell him this. It's all to do with this this gang called the Riders of Justice, and they then investigate further and then go and Mads Mikkelsen starts getting his revenge on these people. And it's, mm. you've seen, we've all seen revenge thrillers like this, but this one sort of, if this one subverts your expectations, but in the way you should do it, if you're going to do it well, it's, uh, it's what get, what, the main thing that got me was how funny it was. I wasn't expecting to laugh as much as I did because the characters who were are there, like the, they're basically all computer people who are helping Mads Mikkelsen or looking into it. They're all like mathematicians, hackers, uh, computer geeks kind of people. But they're just there's loads of funny moments dealing with some really dark things, uh, and it's all these people who are the are all broken or damaged or have have all they've all had terrible things happen to them in the past. But doing what they're doing while also terrible, also helps bring them together and helps them start healing and helps them become better people. And there's some reveals and twists and turns, which I wasn't expecting. And it just, it's just, I was engrossed the whole way through. It's all just some great, great moments. Uh, just the way it's done is just, oh, I can't go into it without spoiling it, but it's, uh, yeah, check it out when you can. Riders of Justice. It was directed by Anders Thomas Jensen. Uh, it came out in originally in Denmark in 2020, but came out in the UK last year. But uh, Mads Mikkelsen is brilliant in it as well. I uh, just, it's it's my number three, and I just I thought it was brilliant. All right, I I honestly haven't even heard of that film until just now, so I'm going to check that out. I don't know if it's on any of the streaming services over here, um, so I have to take a look and see because it might be. I just I'm not familiar. Uh, so where did you where did you see it in the theaters or? Uh, yeah, it had a limited re uh, release. I guess. Sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so it might be coming out on video at some point soon here then. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll keep my eyes open for it. Okay, cool. All right, I like to learn about new movies. I got a couple of new ones to watch tonight. Yeah, so all right, so my number two um, I, I, is a movie I really loved, and it is um, – I was I'm a little surprised, to be honest with you, because it was in your honorable mentions. And I'm I'm a little surprised it didn't end up in your top 10. Um, and it is Ghostbusters Afterlife. 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, and we did we did a talk about it on the uh, we did an episode where we kind of go in on depth, and I'm not going to spoil anything, so don't worry. Um, I will I will just say that I thought it was as good of a sequel as we could get 30 years after the fact, which is usually a recipe for disaster. I really loved the way they did it. They, you know, set things up for kind of a new franchise if they want to go in that direction. It pays tribute to the original films really, really well. I think it treats all the characters well and with respect. The new cast is great. Um, I really like uh, McKenna Grace as, as the young girl. She's fantastic. Paul Rudd is good. I liked that Paul Rudd wasn't like the main, main character. He was more of a yeah. supporting yeah. character. Um, I thought the kind of ghost mystery behind, you know, what was happening was neat. I thought the action sequences were fun. I thought there was humor in it. You know, I just, it felt like a Ghostbusters movie to me. And that's a high compliment, you know, yeah, because Ghostbusters, you know, the original is one of the greatest movies of all time. And, um, you know, for this to really kind of live up to that and sort of be, to really feel like it gets Ghostbusters and it gets it right. Um, especially 30 years later, which I think is just so hard to pull off is really impressive to me. Um, and I, it was, I, I, you know, the, it, it takes its time kind of building up and the first maybe 20, 30 minutes, I was kind of like, all right, this is a little, it's, a, it's slower going than I expected, maybe whatever, but it just kept building and building and building and getting better and better and better as the film went on. And by the end, I just, I absolutely loved it. And again, just kind of sat there with a smile on my face and just sort of like, loving all the things they did to tie it together with the original. Um, and I, I thought, like I said, if you're a Ghostbusters fan, I don't know that you could have asked for anything more than, than what you got with Ghostbusters Afterlife. So that's my number two, Ghostbusters Excellent. Afterlife. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I really enjoyed it. Just uh, these other films, it was in my top 10, just as other ones got watched. And I just kept reassessing the list. They just moved around. But yeah, sure. it was a nice, it was a good it was good. If they don't do any, make any more, that's fine. But if, as you say, it set it up to go ahead if they want to. Yeah, well, I think that's that's a that's a some that's a good really good point to make there, Phil. You know, if this is the last Ghostbusters movies we ever get, Ghostbusters movie we ever get, it was a great ending. You know, it was a great kind of end cap. If it's the start of something new, I'm also on board. I, then I'm great with that. You know, it, it kind of could go either way, and I and I, I like that about it because I think they did it so yeah. well. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, my number two, you've already mentioned it, mm. but it's June. I, fig uh, I figured, yeah. <laughs> if you look at the posters, and as some of my friends have pointed out, if you look at the poster and the logo, it's they're not all I can see now is Dunk. But anyway, there you go. But it's uh, just because it's that. But it's June, uh, Denny Villeneuve's film, great cast, everything you said before, just totally agree with. Yes, it's very beigey, very sandy in places, but it's on a desert planet. But that was my only criticism, really, was lots of the scenes where you see the actors and it's just behind them is just one colour with nothing. Mm -hmm. And you just sort of go, oh... But that was my only criticism. I, I thought everything else was fantastic. I do. I I love David Lynch's uh, film. I yeah. like some of the miniseries. I, I love the book. Uh, I've always been a fan of Dune, but this this one was, I think, just really nailed it. I love the the technology. The ornithopters were brilliant, and just I, I'm I'm so looking forward to the next one. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I think that might make uh, like I've asked you that might push this one up to like being number one when I look back at it was when they work together as one sure it'd be interesting to see how that uh how that affects it but uh yeah great film great performances all around I think yeah 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah but uh just really really good but you've you already mentioned it and it's my number two yeah, I, I knew it'd be on your list. I had, a, I, or I should say, I had a very strong feeling it'd be on your list. I wasn't sure where it would come in, and, and you know, like I said earlier, uh, this this list could easily be rearranged. I don't know if I would have made it to number two, but maybe, like you said, once the second half comes out and once yeah, you yeah. Kind of watch it as a whole complete epic, it might it might push it up some. You know, um, it, it's also the film out of the on my list which I've seen the most because I saw it on uh, normal cinema, saw it on IMAX, uh, and then. Saw it again with another friend on the cinema again. So it's uh, I've seen it three times. So wow. I think that's the one I've seen it the most. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, like I said, I'm looking forward to watching it again for sure. Cool. So, All okay, right. So here we are. So here we Number are. Number one. Number one. Now, there's a thing that I hate sometimes, which is when you're you're reading like a top 10 list or watching somebody's top 10 list, whatever, and, and somebody's listing all these films and you're like, yeah, I love that movie. And that was a great one. I, I saw that one and this and that. And then they get to their number one and they pull out some obscure little like, you know, French movie that like two people have seen. And you're like, come on, what the hell, man? You can't go to the movie I've heard of. 
And I hate that, uh, which is not why I'm going to kind of do exactly that right now. Um, not that obscure, but I was a little bit surprised to see where one ended up at number one. But when I think about the movies that really impressed me the most this year, the one that I think just really stood out above the rest. And again, I could change this list around. But the one that really just sort of was like really stuck with me and, and was one I've talked about to a lot of people and sort of tried to champion a bit was The Eyes of Tammy Faye, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. directed by Michael Showalter and starring um, Jessica Chastain and Andrew Garfield. Uh, it is a biopic, if you will, of Tammy Faye Baker, uh, again, for the you know, American audiences, I guarantee you, everybody listening knows who Tammy Faye Baker is uh, and Jim Baker, her husband. They were televangelists. Um, uh, you know, European audiences may not be as familiar with them, um, but that should not stop you from watching this film. You know, it was they were like small town, you know, couple became televangelists, got bigger and bigger, turned it into a multimillion dollar empire, which, of course, eventually leads to the inevitable fall. Um, and it tells their story from start to finish. And I think what it does really, really well is a couple of things. Um, it, it tells you a lot more of the story. I think most people who, you know, in America who weren't who weren't religious you know, or fans of, of them probably mostly just think of Tammy Faye and Jim Baker as like, she cries and he, you know, he talks about God. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. And I think it gives you a really uh, interesting portrait of the pair of them. It is not, um, it's not saying, Hey, these people are perfect. You know, it's, I don't think it's out to vilify them. I think it does a pretty good yeah, job yeah. of sort of, you know, showing things as they were to an extent. I'm sure it's, you know, dramatized for Hollywood and all that stuff. I get it, but I think it does a, a pretty good job, but it's, it's riveting. Like you just, you just like, what's going to happen next. It's like almost like watching a thriller. Cause you're just like, what's going to happen to these people? This is just getting bigger and bigger. It's a house of cards. It's going to fall down. I want to see how it all happens. Um, Jessica Chastain's performance is absolutely phenomenal. Um, she gets this, this, the sort of giggle laugh that Tammy Faye does down that you hear throughout the movie. And it's, it's just amazing. They put some makeup on her by the end, especially she looks nothing like Jessica Chastain at all. In the very beginning, you see Jessica Chastain. And then before you know it, she's Tammy Faye. And you're just like, I can't even tell who I'm looking at. Um, Andrew Garfield, about the last person in the world I would have cast to, to play Jim Baker. Brilliant. Absolutely nails playing Jim Baker. Um, just it's, the two of them together are phenomenal. The story is fascinating. I, 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 I was just glued to the screen. I, I was like, I couldn't take in this movie fast enough. Um, it's really, really good. I was very surprised by it. Do not have to be religious in any way, shape, or form to watch it. It is not really a religious movie. There's a lot of talk about God and Jesus and stuff like that, but it's in the framework of them building this empire. It's not a movie for faith-based audiences like some of yeah, those yeah. You know, Christian yeah. movies are. Um, in fact, Michael Showalter, the director, I mean, he's known for things like The State, you know, and, and all these various comedy shows with, you know, all those guys like Ken Marino and, you know, all the kids in the hall and that type of, you know, people. Um, that's kind of his, um, you know, Wet Hot American Summer, those types of oh, things. Oh, yeah, that's so, right. They did that, yeah. Um, you know, so not, not definitely, but it's a serious film, has some comedy, but like, I, it's just fascinating and it's, it's fantastic and I loved every minute of it. So that's my number one, The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Go figure. Excellent. But I'm telling you, if Jessica Chastain doesn't get nominated for an Oscar, then what are we even doing here? Yeah, well, that's a good choice because I remember you talking about that when you saw it, but it's it's still uh, here in the UK. It, that doesn't come out until next month, so I've not oh, seen it. Oh, well, definitely yeah. go see it. Don't even wait for video if you can help it. It's worth seeing it in the theaters. Yeah. Um, and we have a comment I'll just quickly throw up here. Uh, a friend of the show, Jay Tanner Perry, says Jessica Chastain is a beast in that film. She really is. It is a performance for the ages. I mean, you will be amazed at what, she, how she transforms herself in it. So I agree, Jay. Good call. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's your number one. My number one, like we said at the beginning is a double whammy. So two films, cause they kept going back and forth, back and forth. One of them, I was surprised didn't make your list. And I'm not sure whether you mm -hmm. forgot about it or whether just other things. Okay. But, uh, the, the two curious. films are Spider-Man, No Way Home. Mm. And Pig. Interesting. Okay. Yes. As I said, they're both wildly different <laughs> yeah, films. Very different films, for sure. Uh, one of them stars Nicolas Cage. The other one doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. You've got to guess which one. No, okay. But yeah, Spider-Man No Way Home. I really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed uh, Tom Holland's Spider-Man. I like the way the story built. I'm not going to go into any details, but I just, I like the way, well, in the trailers we saw some bad guys come back. I really like the way they came back. I love the performances from them. It was fantastic. Even the ones from the uh, 
because you mentioned the other they did from the amazing spider-man who, who did some of them turned up they were great to see it made me reassess the other oh, i can't talk into details made me reassess certain things which uh, made me want to see other certain things again uh which i really enjoyed Oh, it's mm -hmm. crap when you don't want to spoil it. I but know. anyway, it's hard uh, the performances about. all around were amazing. There was lots of moments where I went, where I was just had this warm feeling going, oh, wow. Oh, that was so nice. That was so good. Oh, my gosh. Lots of all that. It was an emotional roller coaster. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was maybe a bit over long. Could have been cut down a bit, especially there was like a flabby bit in a couple of places. But I just dug the way I felt. It was nice being in the cinema, just having that sensation of like, of like joy, happiness, uh, but also, oh my God, I can't believe that's happened. But just, and the, the ending as well, just just left me feeling, oh no, poor that guy, because of what's happened. Oh my God, it's so hard. <laughs> but yeah, you know what I mean? If you've seen it, you know what I mean. I just really thought it was done so well. And it was a nice, it was nice. And if, if we just left it with the Tom Holland's Spider-Man, just as a trilogy of those three films, I'd be happy with that. Uh, yeah, we'll have, we will have to do that. We'll have to come back and talk about it because uh, Jay Tanner Perry just said, we need the Spider-Man No Way Home spoiler-filled review. We'll yep. get to it at some point. But uh, yeah, it was not, it's a brilliant trilogy. Uh, we're going to get some more as well. But hopefully it will build on to other things. But we shall have to wait and see. But that was my one of my number ones. And the other one was Pig starring Nicolas Cage and directed by, uh, I wish we had his name, Michael Sarnowski. Who was also announced today it's going to be possibly directing a new acquired place film but uh, pig is a great a great slow burn film dealing with loneliness and grief and it's not at all like the john wick kind of film that the trailer promised okay and it's not like a it's not a nicholas cage film either you because initially i was watching it just kept waiting for the go full nick cage and there's yeah. a few moments where you see him go and that's you you forget he's won an academy award but this film reminds you again and i can hopefully i hope he gets nominated but it's one of those films which came out near this earlier in the year which often seems to get forgotten about right and nicholas cage's performance is just stunning as you learn about why he is living in the woods with his truffle pig and yeah. what's happened to him and the the other characters he interacts with uh the the, well, there's even a little Fight Club thing in, which was again was a point where I thought, "Oh, here we go, Nicolas Cage film. This is where it's going to go." But no, even that doesn't go the way you think. It just makes you want to sit down and have a meal with people you love, and it shows the power of food and memory, and and just what people have to do to deal with grief and in many different ways, and how it can affect how you, the way you deal with grief can affect other people without you realizing it, but it's just, it was a stunning performance by Nicolas Cage. And it was, it's so nice to see him acting again. He seems to be having a bit of, well, he acts all the time, but you know what I mean? I Seeing him mean. really get into the performance and be this person, this who's just trying to, to live the best life he can with his truffle pig. And yeah. None of which makes me want to watch that movie, I have to be honest with you. Uh, the fact that you're number one makes me at least a little interested, but nothing mm. you said describing it makes it sounds like a movie oh, that I would enjoy. I fully, I fully expect you'll end up watching it and I'll get another message from you going, Phil, I watch Pig. What are <laughs> yeah. you on? What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I do like Jay's comment, though. Combine them, the two movies, Spider Man and Pig, for Spider Pig. Now that's a movie. Yeah. Well, Nicholas yes. Cage did uh, do Spider Man Noir, didn't he, in the, Into the Spider Verse? Right, right. Okay. exactly. Yep. So but, um, I like that. If you haven't uh, seen it, if you've been put off by Nicolas Cage being full Nicolas Cage, shouting and pointing, he doesn't do that. We well, might, he might point, but <laughs> uh, but it's just it was it was a fantastic film, and it's it's just I didn't think it'd be my number one. I thought it'd be in the top ten, but it's just as the, as the years gone on as well, I keep thinking about the the list, and I've, my thoughts have gone back to that film over and over again, thinking about right. it, what it means. Interesting. So. You'll remember at the start of the show, I said that there was, uh, I had an honorable mention that I was saving. Oh, I yes, yes, want to yes. Bring up, and that was Spider Man No Way Home. Yeah, um, yeah. I feel like I really enjoyed Spider Man No Way Home. I did. Um, but as I was watching it, I kept, sometimes I watch a movie and I just get sucked into it. And I don't think about anything. And sometimes I watch a movie and I'm sitting there and I sort of like talk to myself in my head and I'm like, 
hey, this part is really good. And I always feel like that's me trying to talk myself into liking the movie more than I did. And oh, I, I think yeah. I, it's I've had this thing with Marvel movies lately where I've always enjoyed them more the second time I watch them. I don't know if it's because I let myself get a little too hyped up for them. I try not to, but sometimes I think maybe I do. Or maybe yeah. because once I know all the, the twists and turns that are coming, I can sort of sit back and just enjoy it for what it is. Um, and I haven't seen Spider-Man a second time yet. So I don't know if that would affect it or not. Um, I really liked it, but there's definitely parts where I was watching it in the theater and I was like, I... I like this, but I'm not falling in love with it, you know? Um, and I'm not sure. I can't put my finger on what it was. I really think I need to watch it again. And I wouldn't be surprised if I watch it a second time. And then I'm like, hey, guess what? It's my number two, you know, or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, it won't surprise me at all. Because uh, I've had that with a number of Marvel movies in the last three or four years. Um, but that was my experience watching it was I really liked it. Uh, but there was parts I felt like it maybe tried a little too hard. And I, I kind of felt like I was talking myself into liking it more than I actually did. And I try not to do that anymore. I try to be honest yeah. and just sort of say, hey, I, either I love this or I, I stopped short of loving it and I really liked it. And I think that's where I came down on Spider-Man for now. Um, yeah. But again, yeah. I'll rewatch it again soon and I may have a different experience. So, uh, yeah. But as I was looking at the list, I was kind of like, I just don't know that I can put it ahead of these other films, you know, and I know I'm in the minority on that. Uh, here's Jay. He says after the third time, it's in my top five of Marvel films. Now I I've seen that comment from a lot of people, that type of comment. I've seen many people who saw it once and said it was their favorite Marvel movie ever, which I find strange personally. Cause I, I don't know that I think it's that good. Obviously if they made my top 10 even, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I know people really liked it. I know I'm in the minority. Most people said it was just like the best thing ever, 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 uh, which is great. I'm glad everyone loved it that much. I just haven't had that that experience yet, but it's close. Yeah. It's close. I, I was. I, I would have loved to have seen the film without knowing the spoilers, even the ones with the, you know, the villains that were shown in the trailer. Right. I wish it would have been great. I know it's impossible in this day and age of the internet, but yeah. imagine if they just had it set up so it looked like it was going to be like a Spider-Man versus Doctor Strange. Yeah, and there was no hint of anything else. Can you I, I, imagine being in the cinema when the first reveal and the next one and the next one next and just it would have been oh my oh, oh, oh. and it right. probably just would have been what's going on and you go straight back in again after watching it for the next show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been that would have been awesome. I'm I'm happy to say that uh, you know I didn't have any official spoilers ahead of time. I had my strong suspicions about what was going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I didn't have anything confirmed, which is really nice, so that when things happened in the film, I was able to at least be, you know, relatively surprised, right? Again, I kind of had a feeling I knew it was going to happen or who was going to show up or do whatever, you know, but I was like, all right, I don't know for sure if this is really, if anything's really happening or not. And, you know, so it was nice to sort of see how things happen and where they happen and who happened and all that stuff. I was at least able to kind of go into it as, you know, as spoiler free as possible in this day and age. So that was, that was nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah. Pig. Interesting. I keep seeing the, the the image for it on Netflix or whatever. And I just look at it and I go, eh, I don't think so. So yeah. uh, I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to I, think I, I really, that. I really liked it. It was uh, All right. well, obviously because it's my, my joint number one, yeah. but, uh, but that was uh, some, some good list. We had some, we had some, 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 some of the same films. Yeah, the same yep. places as well, which was good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, some some decent overlap, um, but a lot of also different which films, which is nice. I like that we don't just have the same list twice. That would get boring, I think. So hopefully people uh, enjoy it. Uh, Jay seems to agree. He says, keep up the great work, fellas. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you very we will, much. We will try. Um, but there you go. So those are our top tens. A couple of honorable mentions. I think that's a pretty good, like if you sit down with, with these 15 or 20 films and you know, you watch them over a couple of weeks, I think you're going to find you're, you're going to have a pretty good time, a pretty good movie watching experience. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was some films we didn't get to see. I didn't get to see, uh, last night in Soho, the Edgar Wright film yep, yep. off the top of my head and a few others. So, I don't uh, know yeah. um, couple i was looking forward to watching i didn't get to see either yet um last night in soho was one of them um uh the king's man was one and uh american underdog uh, which probably has a more of an appeal here in america than in, in england but those are three that i was really looking forward to that could have potentially made the list but i haven't seen them either yeah, because yeah. the film end of the year films can be tricky to get to with scheduling and stuff sometimes so if we see those and they're like oh wow that would have been on my list we'll mention it in a future episode you know yeah um, when we get around to watching them, we'll, we'll sort of do a little update for you guys. So good reason yeah. to keep listening every episode. Definitely. But if you are watching this on YouTube or on the, the recording on Facebook, or if you're listening to it on the podcast, on wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, you can leave comments on most of those places. So let us know what you think of our top 10 list for 2021. 
let us know what films really hit you in 2021 and what films you're looking forward to for this year. Yep. Uh, it's always good to drop us a line. Let us know the films you're loving, the films you want to see, the films you want us to do after the endings for and so on. But uh, yeah, great list. I really enjoyed doing that. Absolutely. Always good yeah. to do. It's nice to do. We only get to do it once a year now. You know, we used to do them every week in the first hundred episodes of the show. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now, yeah. now we only get to do them once a year because we've already done all the, the last hundred years of Hollywood. So yeah, that's right. For people who uh, have only been watching goes for like the past year or so. Yeah. Before this, when we were just an audio podcast, we did our top 10 films of every year. What was the full title? I always forget it. You always did a hundred years of Hollywood in a hundred episodes. That's right. Yeah. And the, we certainly did, and that was good fun. Yeah, yeah. From 1917 through 2017, at the time when we started, uh, we mm -hmm. did you know top ten every week, um, starting around episode nine or ten, I think. We didn't do it in the very original episodes, but then we did it for you know uh, all for 100 episodes, and we went through every single year and listed our top ten list for those years. So um, that was a lot of fun. But now we only get to do it once a year because we already covered them all. So yeah, uh, it's, a, it's always it's a bit good of a relief. Read. <laughs> yeah yeah right exactly it's a lot of work um but uh there you go so some some good movies for you guys to check out so that's our special episode we didn't do any other features tonight we just as i knew it would take us at least an hour probably to get through this list and i was right so yeah, um, yeah. i think that is a good cue for us to start wrapping up um so like phil said we hope to hear from you guys see what your favorite films are i hope you guys enjoyed this and hopefully you picked up a couple things to add to your queue or your must watch list based on on our opinions hopefully um and if not that's okay too hopefully you at least enjoyed the episode um all right anything else phil before we get going yeah no i think that's it just yeah just let us know some cool films which you might have missed or not mentioned because it's, mm -hmm. it's we hope we've added films to your list but it's also good if you can add films to our list so we can without watch. a doubt yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Well, there you go, guys. We will be back again uh, very shortly with a new episode. We'll get back to our regular format. Uh, but until that time, thank you for listening. As always, I'm Mike Spring. And I'm Phil Edwards. And we'll see you next time. After the ending.